and I, if you're there, um, I guess we should start recording. Is that all right with you? Because uh, for all the participants, for the people who are on, these uh, programs are uh, recorded and then they're shown later on CCTV, which is channel 17. And I'll send you out um, notice of when that happens. Okay, is that all right? Hi, Joanne. Hi, Tim. Hi. So, Hi, Joanne. Are we supposed hey. to say hola? Hola. hola. Yeah, right. Buenos días. Buenas okay. Buenas tardes. So I guess Megan will start recording if that's okay. Um, uh, my name is Sandy Barrett and welcome to our Vicky presentation tonight in the Spanish-American War and the decision I think on the part of the United States to uh, extend its destiny to the Pacific and to all of Latin America. The Spanish-American War was in 1898 and continued really at probably until 1902 or 1903 when there was an agreement made to actually get Guantanamo and to have an American base in Cuba. So I welcome everybody's participation and, if, and conversation. This is mainly, I hope, an evening that we can converse about that very important manifest destiny. I call manifest destiny two. Manifest destiny first on the part of the United States, or at least the Anglo fund areas of the United States, was to extend those 13 English speaking colonies to the coast, to the West Coast. And remember, that was more or less successful by 18, certainly by 1898, although there were states, I think, that came into the United States after that point, mainly Alaska and also Hawaii. But at, in 1898, I wanted just to mention that the United States was still competing with uh, world powers for ascendancy, I think, in the Pacific and also in China and also in all of Latin America. There were two remaining colonies in Latin America and the Caribbean that were owned by Spain at the time. Those two colonies were Cuba and Puerto Rico. The United States in this war took advantage of the Cuban struggle for independence in Cuba against Spain. And the United States took advantage of that and interceded supposedly on behalf of uh, the Cuban independistas. But at the end of that war, which was concluded fairly quickly, the United States retained a hold over Cuba and Puerto Rico both. The results of that, the consequences of that for, for both of those uh, former, co well, also colonies were different, however. Cuba more or less became an independent nation at that time in the, at the end of the Spanish-American War and threw off the Spanish uh, colonial empire. However, they were left by being rather crippled by the then powerful United States. In a series of amendments, a series of laws, the United States through the Platt Amendment kept control over the foreign policy of Cuba so that Cuba could not be an independent actor uh, in on the world stage in any way. They had to remain, Cuba had to remain more or less loyal to the, uh, to the American empire. Secondly, in Puerto Rico, and I hope that Jorge addresses himself more to this, or uh, Joanne and Tim also, both come from Puerto Rico or grew up there, um, Puerto Rico we, was more or less incorporated into the United States and made what was called a Commonwealth of the United States, which I believe left Puerto Rico in a less independent state, certainly than Cuba, and became part of the United States, but not clearly a state, not clearly uh, a, a colony either. Puerto Ricans uh, are left in a sort of a limbo position of not either being an independent country or not fully incorporated as a state into the United States. At the same time, if you regard the Spanish-American War as a context contest for Spain with Spain for to re basically replace the Spanish Empire in the world, more or less, the United States also sought to control the Pacific at that time and began a slow march, I believe, aimed at China, aimed at having influence in China. It was at the same time that the other superpowers of the world were also competing for China, for the markets of China. The superpowers at that time being England, France, Germany, and the rising Japan as well. So the United States had to 
basically uh, replace the Spanish empire in Latin America, but also the uh, Pacific began to try a march toward uh, being hegemonic in the Pacific. That included Hawaii, that included, that's when Hawaii was conquered by the United States and on to the Philippines when the United States essentially got the, Sp- the Spanish empire out of the Philippines and the United States became the uh, powerful in the Philippines. With us tonight to speak more in, uh, about this uh, march to empire with the consequences of that are Jorge Rodriguez from Puerto Rico, uh, Armando from Cuba, and Grant Crisriel, who'll talk a little bit about Hawaii as well. People don't, I think, realize anything much about the conquest of Hawaii. I don't think Americans really know either about Puerto Rico or Cuba, but I don't, uh, I think that the whole situation in Hawaii was rather unknown to most Americans. Hawaii now is a state, it became a state, I think, in 1959, is that correct? 58. 58. Um, Puerto Rico is not a state, and Cuba is an independent country, but it's paid a very heavy price 59. for that. You're right, 59. Hawaii came in in mm-hmm. 59. But Cuba has paid a very heavy price because in 1959, the Cubans had a socialist revolution in Cuba, and they have since that time paid the heavy price of the United States through an embargo against Cuba and through an attempt to, I think, change the regime in Cuba to have a regime in Cuba that's more friendly to the United States. But anyway, maybe we'll start with maybe Puerto Rico. Is that okay with everybody? And maybe Jorge can talk a little bit about the situation in Puerto Rico. Okay, go ahead. I'm uh, I'm gonna put a presentation up, but I don't know that you're gonna see it, but I'm just gonna put it for me. Can you see me? Yes, we can yeah. see you. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'm, so I'm seeing a presentation that I prepared, but you're not seeing it, but it's okay. I'll just give you, uh, in, in a nutshell, um, what I see the Spanish-American War, uh-huh. especially in the Caribbean, is a consolidation of U.S. Uh, uh, expansion, you know, which started, like uh, Sandy says, to the West and then continued uh, in the Caribbean. And, and of course, uh, the countries that were targeted were Cuba and Puerto Rico. I'm going to talk more about Puerto Rico, but I'll just say a few things because this was part of a grand plan. Between 1898 and 1924, there were nine country, eight countries that were intervened by the US, okay? And most of them multiple times during between the 1920s and and they were Panama, Nicaragua, Mexico mm-hmm. during the second you know in uh, revolution, uh, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Honduras, and of course Cuba and Puerto Rico. Uh, I'll say a little bit about Puerto Rico. It's about 3,500 square feet, uh, square miles. Square feet. <laughs> I, I, I I think it's about 15 times smaller than Cuba. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. So it's it's really uh, was an unimportant economic colony for Spain. Uh, In those years, Cuba was the king, but I I have to remind you that in the 500 years of history, both Cuba and Puerto Rico were completely unimportant because the money was in the gold and the silver Uh in Mexico and Peru and Bolivia. So, um, you know, so it was later than when actually uh, the Spaniards took the advantage of the Haitian Revolution and the growth, uh, the Spaniards, you know, learning that the sugar production was super, you know, important, and they started their empire in the 1800s, and and that's where where the sugar boom came for Cuba, which probably meant about half, 50 percent of of the Spain's economy, which is huge. So, but Puerto Rico, as compared to that was much smaller, much less important. And there's a few things that are important about Puerto Rico, and especially as different from Cuba, is that Puerto Rico uh, really had a a multi-crop. You know, they weren't heavy into sugar cane because it wasn't big enough and and it wasn't important enough. So we, uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, there was more crops and that was tobacco and coffee. Okay, um, and uh, so that is a difference. So when uh, 
you know, I'll just say a few things just before uh, before the uh, occupation in 1868 was a kind of like a series of rising in Lares. About 600 people got involved. And then just half a year before the occupation, the 1897 Carta Autonomica gave Puerto Rico a legendary, you know, kind of like autonomy. Really, if you look at it, it wasn't complete autonomy, but the Puerto Ricans had a lot more rights under these new conditions, granted a lot of liberties that that they didn't that we didn't have in the previous 400 years. Mm-hmm. And just that lasted about three months. And then in July, the US occupation started. July 13th, it lasted a month, okay? In December 10, there was a Treaty of Paris that granted Puerto Rico, you know, uh, to the US. I just say a few details. It was General Denzel Mines with 18,000 troops that invaded the southwest coast of Puerto Rico in Guanica, but it quickly spread all the way through on the way to San Juan. And again, in one month, they took over the island. Uh, so um, uh, a few things. Immediately, there was a law that was called the Foracal Law. Basically, after the about six or seven months of uh, military occupation, uh, you know, and the there, there was a, the imposition of a civilian government with an appointed governor by the by the president of the U.S. Supreme Court appointed by the president of the United States, and there were 35 elected representatives. Uh, in quotes, I mean, uh, you know, it was kind of like the first House of Representatives. But all federal laws applied. Okay, another blow that's not talked too much that was more important economically was the Hollander Law. The Hollander Law in 1901 imposed a 1% tax on all land. So imagine all the landowners in Puerto Rico now had to pay 1%. But not only that, they devalued the Puerto Rican peso, which was a Spanish peso, 40%. Mm -hmm. So everybody who had, you know, $100, Mm -hmm. now they had $60 Mm -hmm. instead of 100. And so what that made is what happened is that was a heavy expropriation of land. Basically, the U.S. wanted to reestablish a sugar mono Mm -hmm. mono crop economy, capitalist plantations, mega plantations. So they had a few landowners that were able to grab uh, uh, land from small landowners. And that immediately created a large labor force. All these former, you know, small farm owners, now whether they were labor laborers, they could be laborers for these large plantations, okay? Mm-hmm. And that lasted for about 30 years. Now in between, well, of course, they changed to monocrop now, sugar plantations versus multi-crops. Right. And, and the small farmers becomes workers. In 1917, the Jones Act granted US, US citizenships to Puerto Ricans, but that didn't come you know, cheap, you know? Uh, we also had to sign an agreement that we had to use the, the US Marine, uh, uh, naval, uh, mar- uh, merchant Marines. So we are, you know, Puerto Ricans were not at liberty to, cho- to choose you know, who was gonna pr- transport the goods. And in an island, well, you need to transport everything. That is key, you know, that's like the lifeblood. Uh, well, in the 1930s, nationalist movement rose and they, you know, they've been, you know, significant, but very, very little, but they were very hard hit by the US government and the FBI. Of course, we all remember the attacks on the Blair House and yeah. the Congress by Puerto Ricans. That was part of all that movement. And in 1948, for the first time, uh, you know, we could elect a governor, a governor, okay? And then that that followed what 1952, the new constitution, which like Sandy says, is the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rican words, it's called the free associated state, the Estado Libre Asociado. But it's still, you know, we still have federal courts, you know, we still have some army bases, although most of them are gone. And you know, of course, the U.S. Post Office. You know, we are under federal authority. Politically, today we can't vote for a president unless I move to this country, like I did. And you can do it easily. You just move, but you can't live in Puerto Rico, reside there, and vote for the president. Oddly enough, you can vote for the candidate. So you, you uh, on the, the primary, uh, on the primary. So, right. so you know, all the presidents they love Puerto Rico. So they want to, they want to get nominated. They go there and get the few mm-hmm. delegates that we got. Uh, we have a representative on the Congress. 
And uh, I don't know if you, you, you know, I, I can go on, but, you know, I think time is of the essence. And I don't know if you wanted me to expand to what's the situation now. Yeah, I think maybe we could um, maybe leave that for questions or does yeah. anybody, I mean, maybe exactly. we could ask Armando and uh, yeah. Grant also. Okay. Exactly. Uh, I, thought, I thought that would be better because the other part is, it's more complicated, it has other things. <laughs> okay, Armando, about Cuba. <laughs> Did we lose him? I no, I'm, I'm I'm muting. But you can have some. I want. I'm. I am interested in hearing about about the uh, current situation. Can you hear me? Oh, you can hear me. No, hold it. Sure, I can hear you. Yeah. All right. So my, I'm not going to get into um, a lot of the things other than starting with um, the U.S. Af basically the impact of the um, um, war on Cuba was early on where Cuba became a protectorate of the U.S., which yeah. meant basically Cuba was under the control of the U.S. for th four years, from 1898 to 1902. And in that time, um, obviously, the, the, Cuban, um, the Cuban was not necessarily in control of anything. The U.S. was there, and, and actually that's where some of the businesses started getting their hands in there. But the most important part of that was that they then became part of writing the Cuban Constitution. And particularly in the Cuban Constitution, when you look about impact, the biggest impact was the requirement that the Platt Amendment be in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, an annexed to the Constitution. And basically, the Platt Amendment gave the U.S. complete authority over any treaty or deals that the U.S. was making with um with other countries, the U.S. Could, could turn it down. Um, the U.S. could intervene in Cuba at any time they felt that their democracy, if you will, was at risk, elections, and they did on two separate occasions. In 1916 and 1928, the U.S. Uh, became involved in the outcomes of Cuban elections to basically overturn them um, for the candidate that they wanted. Um, another big part of this was the military, military was able to stay which yeah. had a huge impact on Cuba. And of course, with the military staying, they needed a, a location. So part of it was that the Cuba would, would lease them land for a military base. And that land ended up being Guantanamo. <clears throat> um, and that basically Cuba um, was only Cuba the island, but not, not Isla de Pino, which is now the Isla de la Juventud, Isle of Youth, was not considered part of Cuba. Cuba, when it was independent, only the island. And then eventually, because there were more Americans actually living in Isla de Pino than, were, than Cubans. So the Cubans had a lot of people move there, and then they, they, they were able to say, oh, this is really part of Cuba. But nevertheless, it was that type of a thing that the U.S. had power over, as well as Cuba, uh, U.S. being able to intervene in any uh, issue that they felt they wanted to. And back to the original pieces, they wanted, because of the Panama Canal was being was built, they wanted Puerto Rico and Cuba on the on the Caribbean Atlantic side, and they wanted the Philippines, Hawaii on the Pacific as a protectorate for that. And that's where Cuba came, well, you know, obviously Cuba came in. And, you know, during that time, uh, Cuba uh, got the voting of everybody in Cuba, except only for males, women or blacks were not allowed to vote. Um, the economy became very dependent on sugar. It, it truly became uh, a mono uh, production. And World War I spiked prices, the depression down. So it was an up and down uh, economy with many of the Cuban owners of those centrales going bankrupt and then being bought out by uh, U.S. companies. So the economy then became very much dependent on U.S. Uh, on U.S. influence and Cuban money that was involved with sugarcane, poverty was was uh, was you know everywhere. There was over half a million people in a small population that were um, unemployed. But one of the main things that the U.S. wanted out of Cuba is they didn't want to annex Cuba because annexation then meant you had to deal with like Puerto Rico. You had to deal with all these issues. Where but if you made them uh, independent. And just an extension of the U.S. system, you can have the best of both worlds without having to deal with all the issues. And that's ultimately what they got all the way through uh, the revolution in the 50s, 
which again was part of, uh, which was started as a result of this, student groups started to see the inequalities. They started to see the influence of the U.S. on Cuba, the Platt Amendment, and that led to the communist, the Cuban Communist Party, uh, youth organizations at the, at the University of Havana. That eventually led to um, to Bat- oh, working with Batista, if you can believe it. Batista worked with the students, um, but then eventually became a dictator, and and the rest is history as Cuba became an independent. But the impact of the of the initial impact of the um, Spanish American War was huge on Cuba, and not necessarily in a good way. Can I mention one thing before we turn to Hawaii, and that is that neither one of you mentioned that both Cuba and Puerto Rico were populated by slaves, by black slaves, and that uh, Havana in particular was a huge market, actually, where slaves were transported to Havana. Some came to North America and some didn't, but it was but slavery really built the wealth, the wealth of Cuba and Puerto Rico. But the wealth was eventually- but that, was bef- that was before but, the U.S. Yeah, that was before, yeah, not but, post. Right, but Cuba right. was, as you're right, Sandy, every, I mean, just about every slave that came into the Americas passed through Cuba. Cuba, you know? right, right, Cuba right. controlled 50% of the slave trade of the whole Atlantic states. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, and, and that's why I don't think people really in the United States understand uh, the whole connection with Africa in the Caribbean. That they don't, I don't think Americans even think of Cuba as a black country are uh, as a people of color country, made mainly made up of people of color, because they don't, they see people like Armando in this country, and they think that's, uh, that Cubans are basically white, but they are not. I mean, but the majority of the Cubans, I mean, even, even now, it's still not over 50% black in Cuba. No, but, mm. but they're, uh, as far as I can tell, there are a lot of people of color. Oh yeah, there's a lot of people, yeah. People, yeah. Right, you know. yeah. But anyway, um, that was very profitable also for the new world, of course, was the slave trade. Okay, but uh, Grant will maybe say a few words about Hawaii. Um, okay, so um, I just come at this because at Burlington College, I taught a course on uh, cultural encounter, and we did a week on Hawaii, and that's where I learned a lot of the history of, of uh, Hawaii, which I think maybe people don't know too much. Um, just a, moment, a word, first of all, about the location, which is maybe we all know, but it's basically the latitude of Mexico, west into the Pacific and sort of a third of the way across the Pacific between the Americas and what the Philippines and uh, Asia. And geology, uh, geography turns out to be a very important factor for what happened to uh, Hawaii. Uh, it's a very interesting story because in Hawaii, there were profound changes going on exactly at the same time as the encounter with the, uh, the Americans and the Europeans. Uh, within uh, Hawaii, um, in the 18th century, this all started, there was a reorganization going on there had been wars and wars and wars going on between groups in the islands. Finally, there was a, an overall conservative monarchy installed over all the islands um, uh, except Kauai. And for the first time, it was a united, a unified uh, government, a unified a conservative monarchy. Uh, at that time, exactly, uh, Captain James Cook, you've probably heard of, uh, who was an explorer, um, of, came to Hawaii. Uh, and from a European point of view, kind of discovered it. Of course, it was always there. but. Um, the Europeans weren't much familiar with it at all. This was 1778 and 1779 that he made two visits to uh, Hawaii and, and published an account of his travel, travels and an account of what he found in Hawaii. And this was widely read and widely known and this sort of started this whole European and, and American influx into, into the islands. Um, as part of this um, consolidation of the islands into a, a monarchy, oddly enough from my point of view, the um, the, what had been the religion of the Hawaiian Islands, the religions, plural, of the Hawaiian Islands, and all of their symbolism and all that was suppressed and um, eliminated, basically. So Hawaii was sitting there with no religious factor to their society. And this created a religious void, which was important because into this religious void rushed New England missionaries, uh, very largely Congregationalists, uh, now known as the United Church of Christ. And they, they um, of course, wanted to convert all these people who suddenly didn't particularly have their own religion anymore into Christianity. Um, and set about also um, becoming active in social and political spheres of the of island life. And did, the one side that they, the, that they did was they created a written, a written form of the Hawaiian language, which never had been one of before. It was taught widely by them. And it's thought by mid, mid 19th century, about 100% of, of native Hawaiians were uh, literate. Um, in 1848, the mid century again, the Maheli was introduced, and the Maheli was the 
um, change and dra a drastic change. There's a history of drastic changes for Hawaii for about a century, a drastic change in land use. Uh, so we go from collective ownership of land to private ownership of land, meaning, of course, any individual can own the land, can do what he she or wants or consolidate it. This, of course, was uh, favored by the, uh, the growing class of um, plantation owners and farmers. And, and sort of like uh, Cuba, uh, Hawaii became hugely um, dependent on sugar and, of course, also pineapple, the two things we all probably know of is the agricultural products of um, Hawaii. Um, another factor we don't hear, that we hear less about a lot are the uh, whalers uh, who um, discovered that if they went overwintered in Hawaii, uh, they avoided their whole return trip out to South America, back up to New England, and back again the next year. So, of course, it saved them fantastic amounts of money and effort. So that uh, toward the middle of the uh, uh, 1824 to 43, there were maybe 85 whaler ships overwintering in Hawaii. Uh, by 1846, we're up, to, up to 600. Now, this is not nothing to have all of these ships with their crews spending several months of the winter, not out whaling, but uh, on land, um, drinking and carousing and creating all kinds of mayhem. Um, and it had a big effect on the Hawaiian society. Some of these ports and cities turned into little hell, hell holes to live in for the Hawaiians. And there was a huge amount of upheaval uh, because of them. But of course, what it really was important for us, I think, also, is that it, um, in addition to the social instability that that led to, it also um, established Hawaii as an important and possible and convenient um, stopping over point between the Americas and Asia and, and, the, and the whaling grounds. Um, we're stopping over and resupplying on, on Hawaii. And that becomes very, very uh, important pretty soon. Uh, the, the foreigners uh, in Hawaii had a drastic effect there, as they did in the Caribbean, as they did in North America, especially through disease. And the Hawaii, the native Hawaiian population, the indigenous population, was thought to have been around 400,000 to 800,000 in the 18th century before Captain Cook. Uh, a century later, uh, in uh, 1898, uh, it's down to 40,000. So it's a decrease from hundreds of thousands to 40,000. Uh, or only a quarter of the total population anymore of their own islands, because this is uh, there were foreign workers brought in and were taking over, um, taking over kind of really. Uh, and by the 191980s, there only are 2,000 speakers of native Hawaiian anymore. Um, now, a quick uh, run through the uh, U.S. takeover of uh, of the islands. Uh, it's a familiar story in a way, but it's a story also of striking while the the Hawaiians themselves are at their, their weakest point. Their population has been decimated since the 18th century. Uh, the forms of government have been radically changed. Uh, a lot of social forms have changed. The religious forms have changed. In, uh, uh, in the, the end of the 18th, 19th century in 1887 is the Bayonet Constitution. Uh, the, that monarchy established in the 18th century continues. It's King, Female. Uh, well, it will be. Yeah. It's King David Calacona, first of all, who signed the new uh, signs a new constitution. He doesn't willingly sign it. He signs it, signs it literally under gunpoint. Uh, and of course, the forces who want this are the planters in the agricultural uh, class. Um, uh, then the monarchy changes because he died, and Queen Lilio Kalani is um, queen. Uh, and uh, the planters and businessmen set up a provisional revolt against her and set up a provisional government, which changes its name into the Republic of Hawaii. This is 1894 now. Uh, the next year, uh, the queen is imprisoned in her own palace, in the uh, Yolani Palace in Honolulu. Uh, next year, the Hawaiian language is banned as a language of instruction. And in 98, the big year that we're all talking about here, uh, Hawaii is annexed by proclamation of the United States um, uh, Congress. Um, and uh, she, the queen, protested vigorously about this in prison in her palace. Uh, she couldn't really do it in an armed way, but she wrote to the Congress, to the president, to everybody, protesting hugely. And you can get, this is in the UVM library yeah. and other places, you can get this, these uh, documents and read them, which I have read some of them. Um, uh, so under protest, um, Hawaii is taken over um, by the United States. They simply declare, you're ours now. Uh, 1900, Hawaii becomes a territory. 1959, it's admitted as the 40, 50th state upon a vote in Hawaii, but the vote is we should become a state or not a state. Nothing about independence or anything else, of course. And in 1993, President Bill Clinton signs the Apology Bill, which is a proclamation by the U.S. Congress apologizing to the Hawaiian people for what the United States did to them, meaning taking over their, their government, their property, um, and with no input from the Hawaiians except resistance. Uh, and so the, the, and this proclamation is interesting because it, it enumerates explicitly uh, what the United States did, how they promulgated a coup d'etat, how they took over, how they did not um, uh, recompense the uh, 
Hawaiians at all. Uh, and this is to say, gee, awfully sorry, uh, because they're a state by now. Um, so in that same year of 1898, so uh, this of course brings up uh, numerous questions of um, issues of sovereignty, of indigenous rights within Hawaii. And there's a, there's a lot of movement about that, especially since the 1970s. Um, there, there are associations and movements uh, formally organized that uh, militate for um, real statement of, um, of all things Hawaiian, and there are now a movement also of what you might call total immersion Hawaiian schools, where the entire day is taught only in Hawaiian. Um, and that's all, uh, has a lot to do with um, Hawaiian culture and so on. Uh, and there was a constitutional convention in the 1970s also to redo the constitution and revalorize a lot that's Hawaiian. Uh, and find my final word is that um, the annexation happened uh, in 1898, but it was not, it just didn't, wasn't by fiat, by the president or something. It was the Congress, and it was the result of- Our Congress. Uh, yeah, the United States Congress, and the result of a hot debate uh, between those who are pro-expansion and pro-annexation, and those who are anti-expansion and anti-annexation. And these opinions kind of held sway back and forth for a couple of years, until finally there was a period when the pro-annexation people were, were in power, and there was always annexation going on. Uh, in the year of 1898, and so it, it carried, and the place was annexed. Um, so that's you know, what I'd like to say. I would mention a few words uh, about what happened also in the Philippines. At that mm -hmm. time, in 1898, the Spanish-American War, the United States also established a presence mm -hmm. in uh, the Philippines and sort of began, I believe, this manifest destiny defined by our leaders at that time of becoming an empire rather than staying as a continental republic. The Anglophone part of the United States, of course, the English speaking part of the United States had already spread itself to the coast of California, defeating the Spanish empire in Mexico in the war of 1846. But essentially by this war, after, we, after the, uh, the English speaking parts of the <clears throat> continent had succeeded in its first destiny of controlling a continental republic, defeating the Native Americans, defeating the other empires, Spain that held, that held grasp of part of North America, and the French. We can't forget the French as well. The United States then had established its grasp on the whole continent of North America, essentially, with the exception of Canada and then and had also set the borders with Mexico. But then in what many historians call Manifest Destiny II, the United States really turned to overseas expansion by taking the last remaining Spanish parts of Latin America, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. And I guess what you said, Jorge, was there were other places though that were still controlled by Spain in South America, no, is that correct? No, 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 no. What I said is, no, no, everything in South America was liberated in the right. 1820s. Right, by Bolivar, yeah. right? Yeah. By Bolivar and San Martin and O'Higgins and right. all the guys down there, okay? But the only two colonies left right. were Cuba and Puerto Rico. The right. Dominican Republic and Haiti were problematic and they were let go right. many, many years before. Right. So, and the only, so one of them was an economic empire, which was Cuba. The other one was a leftover island that was at the entrance of the Atlantic, from the Atlantic. Uh, it had, uh, you know, some, some uh, strategic importance, but not much economics. Okay. So, um, so, but, but the U.S., uh, occupy or militarily intervene in right because they were establishing a mono a right. mono crop uh, like chiquita banana you know in Nicaragua and in Panama because of Panama Canal and so in all these countries there was a boom of you know uh, export uh, agricultural products usually mono crops so they they went in and uh, approved and uh, um, supported, you know, um, big American companies going in and uh, buying large pieces of land so that this agricultural economy started going. So that's where all these interventions went, you know. Right. Right. I mean, in some of them were not even interventions, but they were economically influencing the economies. Can I mention one other very important date in this history? And that's 1823 and the Monroe Doctrine. Of right? course, that's where it's uh, In 1823, it wasn't clear um, about what country, nation could, would be hegemonic in the Americas. 
In eight, by 1823, if I'm not mistaken, however, all of South America had thrown off Spain. Is that true? By 1823, and they had established themselves as independent republics uh, in Latin America. Correct. Most of them. But the United <laughs> States at that time issued a rather um, rash, it appeared at the time, decision to say to the European powers in 1823, we're not going to let you back here to colonize any of the Americas anymore. And if you try, we will defend the independence of those republics. So it kind of cut both ways. It put the United States in the position of being hegemonic in all of the Americas, but it also meant that the United States had become so powerful that it could actually uh, tell those independent republics that they couldn't either go on their own way, really, that the United States was gonna decide foreign policy for them as well. And I, I believe that, so the Monroe Doctrine had, it was a very important date, it appears to me. It's when the United States really announced itself as the most powerful nation in all of the Americas, right? Yes, and that was followed up by the Roosevelt Corollary. Exactly. Okay? Yeah, by right. Teddy Roosevelt Corollary, which further imposed that they, there was not even any relationship with Europeans here. Right. And, you know, as you know, Teddy was one of the colonels in the, you know, the Rough Riders in Puerto Rico. Right. Was he in Cuba also, Teddy Roosevelt? I don't think Her so. Yeah. Was yeah. he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They stormed uh, San Juan Hill, San Juan which, Hill. Yeah. which most Americans think is a, they assume it's in San Juan, Puerto Rico, but it's actually a hill in Santiago de Cuba. In Santiago. Yeah. 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 Oh. Right. Right. Okay. Are there any other questions or thoughts? Can I just say one thing is I do believe, though, that as the war extended U.S. power in uh, the Pacific, the United States had designs at that point on China. Um, and these were kind of stepping stones to get involved in China as well, which continues, well, not anymore because the Chinese said forget it. But anyway, Kurt, Kurt. Yeah, just an interesting uh, little tidbit uh, as, as you're talking about the uh, Pacific portion of the Manifest Destiny doctrine. Uh, with respect to the Philippines, after the Spanish-American War was over, uh, the United States was engaged in its first real uh, foray into guerrilla warfare, as we know, as we knew from Vietnam in, in the Philippines. It was a brutal occupation, but the Filipinos, because of the number of islands they have, they were very difficult to subjugate. And they fought back using guerrilla warfare tactics that we saw several decades later in some of the, the islands in, uh, during the uh, Second World War in Japan against the Japanese army. And then 20, 30 years later, again in uh, in Vietnam. Right. Were they? Can I ask you a question, Kurt? Um, those people, those Filipinos who fought back and yeah. led that struggle. Were, I think they might have been Muslim. Were they Muslims? Uh, there was a small portion of them that were Muslim because of their proximity to Indonesia. Right. But but they were mostly Catholic. The Spanish had Catholicized uh, most pe most people from the Philippines. If you look at their names. They they sound like you know they sound like Spanish names. Right, right. Uh, I mean they speak their own language, a language called Tagalog. Yeah. But but Spanish is pretty widespread in the Philippines, and they they uh, worship in a in a in a in a Catholic style liturgy in uh, in in the Philippines, and they're and they're very very dedicated Catholics. Yeah. Uh, most times, uh, m most years around Easter, uh, you'll hear stories about a lot of people. You know, uh, again on the extreme, but they actually get involved in crucifixions, the way Jesus Christ was with the nail and the whole thing, uh, to show their um, their their um, their you know their loyalty and their love for for Christ and and what he did and what he went through. Uh, so it's it's a very Catholic you know Catholicized country except for certain areas where apparently in the last 20 years, you know, Al Qaeda was actually able right. to make, uh, create a presence in the Philippines and the U S military, as well as the Filipino military, uh, had, uh, a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of, you know, small size battles 
in some of these islands to root out Islamic extremism. <clears throat> right. That's what I th kind of thought. Okay, are there any other questions or thoughts? I have one. Go ahead. Uh, how does how does Brazil fit into this whole business that goes on in South America? Um, <laughs> does it Brazil? Uh, uh, Brazil has a political history that's completely different. Yeah, that's what I said. Right. Brazil didn't have it didn't have a war of independence. Right. Brazil, right. what happened is that because of the Napoleonic Wars, the Portuguese who control uh, Brazil had to move the the, the uh, they they were they were invaded, so they had to move the whole kingdom to Brazil. So when right, the, right. when the wars were over, the, the old king went back to Portugal and he left his son, and then later his son's independence. But but Brazil is nevertheless, isn't <clears throat> it also correct that all of the South American countries are republics? There are no monarchies left. No, no, there but, are not. Yeah, but Brazil remained a monarchy. Right. Right, right. The 1800s when they independence themselves. Right. They, they, they actually, they actually yeah. republic, they become a republic. Right. The Caribbean islands, some of them are still connected to monarchs in well, Europe, uh, like yeah. Jamaica, right? Well, yeah. It's part of the <laughs> British, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's one monarchy in Aruba is a, is a is one right. 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 And there's a and there's a French too, Martinique. No, 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 the French are right. The French the French are uh, Guadalupe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> um, well, we have one monarchy left though in, in the Americas. I used to have big fights with my students about this, which is what? Canada. Canada. Yeah. Canada. Canada. Yeah. yeah. I used to have huge fights because everybody is, of course, of the opinion that the Canadians are so much more progressive than we are. Well, okay. They do have a monarchy. Back in the middle of the meeting. Any other? Earhart, welcome. How are you? Hi, Hi Earhart. What's your name? Hi, Grant. Hi, Robin. Hi, Robin. Uh, thanks for the presentations. Yeah, I thought I'd, uh, this topic sounded really interesting. I've been meaning to zoom in on uh, one of your conversations. Uh, Sandy, you really raised the point that I wanted to raise, which was, you know, if you want to look at the roots of Manifest Destiny, I mean, they go back to the Louisiana Purchase, they right. go back to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and, you know, frankly, I mean, you know, our supposed Amer American revolutionaries were, you know, they were sort of, I, I, I always think of them as, you know, to be truly revolutionary, you know, you have to liberate yourself. They they were part of, you know, the basically the, the British kind of, they were not far from the British uh, ruling class and they were just another ruling class. And they, you know, basically imposed, uh, ultimately imposed themselves on on their will and the will of the, con the country on the Americas. As, well, as a, as a yes and no, but the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are very important documents. Yes, our founding fathers are deeply flawed. I, 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 I don't want to downplay that, but yeah, please yeah. don't, because you'll really get me going on that one. I don't want to downplay that, but I, I you know, I, I, I always think about, you know, to be truly liberated, you've got to, you know, liberate yourself. And, yeah, I know, but you know, they were slaveholders yeah, and, yeah. you know, all of that. And a lot of their great ideas came from, you know, the Iroquois Nation and, uh, um, yeah. A lot of their great ideas, too, came from the Enlightenment ideas that were promulgated in Europe as well. So, yes, you're right. But nevertheless, read the Declaration of Independence again. OK, Kurt. No, just uh, as a follow up to that point, uh, maybe we're going off on a tangent. But in addition to the Enlightenment, it's also very important if you look at the buildings in Washington, D.C. and really most most government buildings in the United States, the founding fathers also relied heavily on the Greek democracy. Yes. And yeah. and right. Greek democracy was consistent, you know, even though it was the first of its kind, uh, there was slavery yep. and they, they were able to, you know, be OK with that. And also, you know, women didn't have a right to participate in Greek democracy, in Greek democracy. And, you know, a lot of the founding fathers were uh, of that opinion also. I, we I, we understand that. However, again, read the Constitution and read the Declaration of Independence. That's those documents were aspirational. Very few other countries have such aspirational documents or aspirations to be a democracy or even a republic. Most of the most of the countries at that time, remember, were des, were des, despots, ruled by despots or or monarchs. So the, I, I'm just taking a class right now, actually, in um, 
uh, history since 1500, global history since 1500. And when you get to the age of revolutions, it's astounding what those revolutions <clears throat> really did accomplish. Here in the United States, followed by France, followed by Haiti, which was prob probably the most radical of revolutions was probably Haiti, and then the Bolivarian revolutions throughout South America. Those were truly progressive moments in history, at least aspirationally, with all of the problems. The biggest problem for me was the, um, the, the extermination of Native Americans and also slavery, of course. But anyway, that's my pitch about history. That the new world is a revolutionary new world still, at least contradicted, by by places which have no freedom at all. Yeah, Robin, Robin. Yeah, yeah, sorry, my uh, battery died and I had to re, re, reignite myself. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you're, you're getting to Haiti. I wanted to uh, just say that this all became real to me when I was in Haiti and I was interviewing President Aristide in 1991. And um, he said, my goal in my administration in, in 14 years is to alpha, bring alphabetization to all the people and to have a, um, you know, a, a, a real examination of the slave trade in right. 2004. And he was, you know, working on alliances with uh, Brazil and back with um, uh, you know Sierra Leone and the and the countries in Africa to really show people what that whole um, trade was like and help people understand it. And of course he was overthrown and then and then he came back again and then right on 2004 he was overthrown the second time. So. You know the the powers that be, the white powers, the United States didn't want to give Haiti any chance to celebrate the 200th um, anniversary of their revolution and to talk about the slave trade at that time. So uh, Haiti has been suffering uh, for decades. Right and continues to to this day. By the way, uh, we're hoping in this series to have a presentation on Haiti, on the revolution in Haiti, which was, uh, I mean, it's so astounding to me that the revolution in Haiti, the revolution in France and the Bolivarian revolutions looked to the revolution in the United States as key, that they were following the example of the most, to them, radical parts of the US revolution. And we so seldom think that that revolution was radical in any way. But of course, at that period of time, at least in its aspirations, it was a very radical movement. But Haiti after that point was totally shunned by the United States. Is that true, Robin? Yes. And penalized for being the first black republic in the world. Tim, Tim. Um, yeah, I just wanted to maybe ask Jorge, since we have some time, if he could comment on the current situation in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Because it clearly, remains the oldest colony in the world over 500 years of being a colony and has never attained independence. And the United States has imposed on it that financial junta, which is now making all the financial decisions and taking the power away from the Puerto Rican legislature to uh, oversee its own economy. So uh, it's tremendous debt in, in which it's killing it. Yeah, killing it. Yeah, um, I don't really see what the uh, exit strategy is for Puerto Rico, which has been in a depression for the last decade and more. Yeah. Yeah. Jorge. Well, uh, you know, regarding the current events, uh, I I know that uh, an attempt to renegotiate the debt, uh, but the problem is uh, the cash flow situation in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and my understanding is that ever since, uh, well, Maria and now the pandemic, uh, yeah. uh, you, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an outflux of, uh, of population. I don't know if you know, but the yes, population yes. is increasing in the last 10 years. 
uh, and uh, tremendously, and who goes is really the professionals that should stay, yeah. you know, if you want to rebuild the country. So uh, my understanding is that right now it is, and there, of course, we all know there's a junta or there is a, you know, a governing body, but that's just part of colonialism, you know? It's like a, it's like a bank, you know, if you don't pay the mortgage, then the bank tells you, well, you know, we're gonna take control of your of your house. So that's that's what's happening. It's a, a Puerto Rico. It's it's like the property, and and it's owned by the banks of the United States, you know, or by the investors of the United States. So we're treated like a you know like a property, and that's the that's what it is. Now, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, is that right or not? You know, I'm not. To, you know, I don't, everybody has their own opinion. I'm just saying the fact is that we are under the U.S. control. And, you know, if uh, if a big company, uh, at, you know, goes to Nicaragua, American company, and it's uh, it, it, it has billions of dollars, well, and then the Nicaraguan government expropriates it, then the U.S. will invade, you know, <laughs> it's because uh, you take their money. And that is basically what's happening in Puerto Rico, in my view. You know, it's already now, invaded. I'm but sorry? Puerto Rico is already invaded. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, well, exactly. There's no, there's nothing to invade already. <laughs> but now, but now, uh, you know, investors put money in bonds, and uh, and they were um, badly administered. The funds and and the transactions, because they were both badly administered. Uh, you know, and. Uh, so uh, so now how do you go after it, you know? Or, you know, you, you, you can't invade, uh, but you still own the country, so you can force them to pay because you, you cannot put a junta, like there is one in Puerto Rico, to France because they owe you money. You couldn't do that, you know? You could do it to Puerto Rico because it's a colony. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, that is now, you know, if you want, you know, I mean, there, there's a series of, of events that happened uh, prior to this, you know, Puerto Rico uh, in, you know, as it changed from agriculture to, to uh, manufacturing in the, in the forties and fifties operation bootstrap. Well, what, you know, what happened there uh, to incentivize in, in 1976, there was a 936 tax incentive law that let uh, that let uh, companies uh, not have to repatriate their funds. So that was an incentive, and there was a lot of manufacturing, and that's how the economy of Puerto Rico, uh, uh, you know, was really good. You know, up till the 1976, and then that law came out. You know, later in the in the 80s, and uh, you know, it phased out in 2000, and basically. The economy of Puerto Rico, which was manufacturing, is pretty much dead. Yeah. And yeah. So you don't have, we don't have uh, the multi crop economy that we had prior to occupation. Then that got replaced by a not monocrop in, the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sugar, okay. sugar, you know, and, and that got replaced by a manufacturing with incentives. And none of that is there. So how do you go from being on 500 years of, of, of colony to re revamp or restart or re, you know jumpstart an economy that's, that has nothing left? I mean, it has to start from the from scratch. <laughs> Can I mention another thing as a, that happened as a result? I think of the Spanish American War, and that is the establishment, as someone said, of Guantanamo, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that was, I think, in 1902, when the United States demanded and got a military base, a naval base in Cuba. That remains true to this day. The, you know, that was supposed to be a lease, if I recall, for 100 years. And then no, no, the no, Cubans, Sandy, yeah. Sandy, not, not for 100 years, it's in perpetuity. And there, there is rent. Oh, right, but the right. rent that the U.S. owes the Cuban government, the Cuban government, since Castro, has never accepted the payment. Uh, right. Cuba. Right, Money. and uh, it was established. It was established as a coaling station. Right, mm -hmm. and, and if you read the treaty carefully, since it is no longer a coaling station, because ships don't operate on coal anymore, in in a sense, the treaty could be abrogated. It, it could be declared void because it is not performing the function on which it was established. 
But I'm sure that Fidel Castro tried to get us out of there and that the United States said, make us go. And that can't happen without a war. I mean, well, that, there you go. There you right. go. Yeah. But, but, but we, but we play no a good a role for Fidel. All. It's a, having it's a Guant, prison. What, right? having, Guant, having Guantanamo there was good, was also good for Fidel. He could use Maybe. that as a symbol um, of, course. Of, of course, you know. Yeah. So, so I, I know of, all that. The pro the problem is, is that I can't believe, in a way, that the United States has foreign bases at all, anywhere, but especially Cuba. That it that now is a prison, and that it has not been given up by the United States. It's Andy, how many well. countries? How many countries does the U.S. have uh, bases? About seven hundred. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. Oh, right. right. Yeah, yeah. So 700 bases, right. but it's not a 700 countries. But they don't, no, I'm that's not, right. yeah. what? They're at 700 countries. Bases. No, 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 no. Bases. 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 Let's go to outer space. 700 <laughs> foreign bases. Well, we're going to have a base on Mars, too. Yeah, Robin. Robin. Yeah, um, I just want to explain. I'm leaving because I'm going to see the premiere of Jetline, Voices from the F-35. This is a new film made by oh. Duan Peterman and you can just uh you can it's starting at seven and you can just uh type in jetlinefilm.com and you will get the link to go to see this uh, premiere of this film by so, the way I noticed uh, uh, yep. by Ron, but I yep. noticed yep. Earhart yep. works yep. for Bernie Sanders now is that right Earhart? I had to take that. Off. I'm not here in my official capacity, but yes, I do. Okay, so now <laughs> then you can bring all this up with Senator Sanders, I'm sure. The F 35, <laughs> the occupation of Puerto Rico, the occupation of or the embargo, right? I'm his eyes and ears now, so right. <laughs> from your lips to. <laughs> well, you can wish him well, but. Thanks. Anyway. Yeah, I, I've got I've got to go too. I have a neighborhood planning assembly uh, coming up. But I really appreciated the the presentations. Thank you, uh, Jorge and Armando and yeah. and Grant. Um, and uh, I, it's uh, too bad I want to mention um, Robin's left. But you know, one of the things that's kept Haiti down is the reparations yeah. that they paid yeah. to France. Yeah. I don't know if folks right. mentioned unbelievable. That. Right. Um, but I, I, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't end till the early '70s. I think right, they right. continued to pay right. into the early mm -hmm. '70s. To France, to France. They had to for, pay for the loss of the territory. Liberation. That's right. They had to pay for the slaves that they became free. They're no yeah. longer property. Right. They right. saved those. Well, Joanne and I would like to meet Jorge sometime. Oh, my pleasure. Thank yes. you, everybody. Well, Take care. When is he going to be back in this state? Anybody? Um, know? When they invite me, let's see. We're invited. Yeah. Right, Until Labor Day. Maybe. Why, where are you, Jorge? I'm in, my, in Miami. In Miami oh, Beach. okay. Okay. I see. I see. Let me ask you a question. Did, did everybody Did anybody know that uh, the first, uh, you know, Haitian government that wasn't a colony was a kingdom? Oh. Yeah. No, you didn't know that. Well, there was a black king. There was a black king there. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh -huh. Right after independence, after they killed the uh, Toussaint Louverture, there was Dessalines. Yes. That was that was, uh, and then after Dessalines, there was a there was a, a king there that's uh, mentioned in uh, in a book called by a Cuban called uh, the Kingdom of uh, of this world, and that's the first kingdom. That was from an uh, African, you know, born in Haiti, in Haiti, right after independence. Right. Mm -hmm. I yeah. heard that. I mean, Haiti is in terrible shape again. Well, it always is, but it's especially bad right now. Is that right? Of course. I yeah. heard because well, we know, went to, after that there was there was the uh, the the, uh, the earthquake. The earthquake. That, but, but that, Sandy, was, most recently, apparently, there's the phenomenon of gangs in. Yeah. in Hundreds of gangs, literally hundreds of gangs that that kidnap people. Right. That's I heard that on the news tonight. Because yeah. I, I mentioned that because last semester, this semester, we had an interview for Vicky and for our session with um, Tim Reeser, who's the advisor to uh, Senator Leahy. And he talked a great deal about Cuba. I don't know how, if you guys joined oh. that, but I'm good. We're going to ask him because he's been in negotiations also about Haiti. And I'm going to, we're going to ask him to come next semester, maybe even next month to give us. And the negotiations, excuse me, Sandy, right. the negotiations are specifically about a kidnapping, Tim, back to what right. Tim was saying. You the negotiations, 
the negotiations that Tim is involved with in Haiti is of a, a Haitian student studying in New Jersey. I think it was at Rutgers whose family was somebody was um, was was kidnapped. So my point is that the Tim is mentioning kidnapping and that's what Tim was working on. The other Tim, Tim Reeser was working yeah. on um, when we were on the call with him. When when will Biden move on Cuba? Never. He reversed he reverse all the Trump. Uh... Especially Biden won't. No, he won't. He said he was going to, but now what he's. Mean, what you mean he, to, uh, to authorize travel or what? Yes. Yeah, yeah, to to well, uh, open up the way it was. Well, you can travel. It's just you can't. Right now, Tim, there's only one app. They can only fly to Havana. The, the, they can't do any remittances yet. Um, the embassy, the, the consulate office is closed in Havana. So you have these thousands of Cubans who've had appointments or visa applications that are in limbo. So, yeah. I mean, that hurts the Cubans in Miami, the same Cubans who say that they, you know, uh, they want to tighten the, the grip on Cuba. You know, you know uh, how you can send remittances, Armando? If you do a recarga for a telephone in Cuba, yes, they yes. can now convert it. Yes, <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. I've been doing that for a long time. I think Western Union maybe is not back yet, but not, not uh, quite, but they're they're going to be, I think. Yeah. So what you yeah. you you charge 150 bucks and they get they they sell it over there. They can do that. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. Exactly. Awesome. The Cuban American Friendship Society wants to go back as soon as possible. We have a we have a friend there who is the head now of the Mozart Festival. Did I send you the uh, the latest uh, message from Michael Dabrowski? I, 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 a great life. It's amazing, right? Yeah. He's yeah, anyway. Except, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, there is. He's got money. Uh, what? He's got dollars. Well, I, well, I know that I know, but he also is getting to teach a lot, which is really yeah. is he, he teaches the violin, right? Or he, yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I don't know any further questions. All right. Thank you, Armando and then Jorge. Thanks. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Do it anytime. Curry, was I again, Joanne? Okay. Tim, seeing I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. We had Jorge. Bye bye. All right. Bye.